Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar this month. We're going to give just a couple minutes to let people fill into the room. So uh, we'll just chill out for a minute here. <laughs> I'm going to take this opportunity to sneeze. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hopefully that will be it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot to put my webinar relaxing music on. <laughs> Lo-fi for webinars. <laughs> Is that to get you ready for, like, get you in the mood for a webinar? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Get us all in the zone. I like it. Make a Spotify playlist for us, Bethany, so we can use it across <laughs> all the webinar. <laughs> um, bow down, Ice Cube is is my pre um, uh, presentation music. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> a little upbeat. Hey, let's, let's not, you know, denigrate the other members of West Side Connection. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're up in Texas, so I like both coasts. All right. Um, it's three minutes in, and we've got a good majority in. David, would you yeah. like to? kick us off today let's do it yeah where is my script one half a second here guys um good afternoon good day wherever you find yourself in the world i'm super excited to have this 26th webinar episode of when things go wrong uh today we've had nearly 200 registrants uh join us so thank you so much for continuing to have a great audience like this webinar, like all of ours uh, previously, is for you, the audience members. So I've got just a couple of housekeeping items here before I pass it off to Bethany. This episode, just like all others, are recorded. So if you miss it, if you get a jump early, check out our YouTube channel for this and all of our previous 25 episodes. Share it with your friends. Um, so yeah, check out link to our YouTube page. Use the Q&A functions. Um, again, I said this is for you guys. We got some great questions during the registration process, but if you're inspired by something that's discussed by the audience today, throw that in the Q&A and we'll do our best to save some time at the end to answer them. I don't think we'll get to all of them based on the number of questions we get, but we'll do our best. And you know, today is a really extra special episode because the organizations that are represented here today our mean, our very major reason and driving force, why we have access to these products, cannabis products in general. And so I just can't be appreciative enough for the groundwork that you all have laid going back decades. Um, and so it's really important to connect, you know, previously a lot of our episodes really focus on the B2B side, but ultimately this is about the patients and consumers, right? Without patients and consumers, there's no business. There's no marketplace. And so we really need to do a better job at connecting to the patient's needs and the consumer's needs and understanding what that looks like to come back to what best practices are. So with that, I will hand it over to Bethany to get us going. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, well, let's just go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. I am happy to be your moderator of When Things Go Wrong, where we discuss various challenges and issues within the cannabis industry. I'm Bethany Moore, the Director of Content Strategy and Market Growth here at the GMP Collective, where we offer technical and strategic advising on GMPs and standards. And you all know David Valencourt, CEO of the GMP Collective and co-founder of the S3 Collective, as well as vice chair of ASTM International Committee D37 on cannabis. I'm very excited to be hosting this episode. I'm familiar with a couple of our guests and get to know Sasha for the first time as well. Sasha Kalchev Korn serves as executive director for Realm of Caring Foundation, a global education and research nonprofit who seeks to facilitate and encourage 
the mainstream acceptance of transformative plant-powered therapies to benefit individuals and families and serve healthcare providers, as well as the hemp and cannabis industries. Thank you so much for joining us today. And next we have Steph Scherer. Uh, she's the founder and president of Americans for Safe Access, the largest national organization of patients, medical professionals, scientists, providers, and concerned citizens promoting safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. Her direct experience with the medical benefits of cannabis and her political organizing background led her to form ASA in 2002 with the purpose of building a strong grassroots movement to protect patients and their rights. She's become the foremost international leader and expert on medical cannabis patient advocacy and alongside the American Herbal Products Association has created the first industry standard in the areas of distribution, cultivation, analytics, and manufacturing, packaging, and labeling. Additionally, I was happy to volunteer with ASA in the 2000s when I lived in Maryland, so in the mid-2000s, 20 years ago. So um, it was a great experience. So it's very exciting to come 20 years later and have you on this webinar, Steph. Thanks for having me. And we also have Morgan Fox. Uh, he is the political director of Normal, focusing on congressional lobbying and changing federal cannabis laws. As a professional cannabis policy reform advocate since 2008, he's been directly involved in dozens of successful state ballot, state ballot initiative campaigns to establish medical and adult use cannabis programs, as well as legislative victories at the local, state, and federal levels. He's been featured in hundreds of print, radio, television, and online publications, and was most recently the media relations director and chief spokesperson for the National Cannabis Industry Association before joining Normal, and spent nearly a decade at Marijuana Policy Project prior to that. I also had the honor of working alongside Morgan when we both worked at the National Cannabis Industry Association for several years. So this is just great to have the family back together. Thank you everyone for being here. Okay, I'm gonna dive right in. Let's start by talking about the role of advocacy in consumer and patient safety. Let's hear more about how your organization is advocating for the safety and health of cannabis consumers, including patients and any pressing concerns that you're hearing from consumers and patients about product safety. Steph, could you kick us off, please? Yeah. Um, I want to say thank you, GMP Collective, for um, bringing this conversation to patients and consumers. Um, you know, as, as David pointed out, there wouldn't be cannabis businesses without patients and consumers, and we certainly wouldn't be diving into the joys of product safety <laughs> without them. Um, so at Americans for Safe Access, you know, we have been leading the way of product safety ever since we created the um, distribution model, right? You can't um, uh, distribute products to patients without guidelines of how to do that safely. Uh, and I think today, um, our biggest concern is actually what we're not hearing from consumers. And I think the, the biggest uh, threat to product safety or patient safety um, is actually the illusion of safety. Right. There is some um, something happens in consumers' minds in the United States if they, for some reason, if they use a credit card or they um, go to a cash register to buy something, that it must be safe. And so they're not taking the same skeptical view of these products that they might if they would have bought the product out of somebody's, the trunk of somebody's car, right? Like for some reason, it's got a nice little label on it. And so, um, you know, they, they think that Think that it's safe. So we've we've been doing a lot of work in educating consumers and patients about uh, contaminants and about um, you know, the you know, what the symptoms of these are. And I think the you have a lot of naive cannabis users that are coming in, you know, are, are seeing something sold at a gas station, and um, and then maybe they've seen a couple ads um, on um, on TV or um, on the web, and so they try these products and the effects could be the effects of pesticides, right? But they're not sure what the high is. 
And I think there's also this misconception uh, when you talk about contaminants of this, um, you know, like the, the myth of the Halloween guy that puts all those razor blades in candy, right? I think people think of contaminants as something that people have um, intentionally done, right? When in fact, they're just, cannabis is an agricultural product. It's, it's special because it's a bioaccumulator and it will pull anything out of the soil um, that you put in it. And so even people who are cultivating at home um, you know, need to be aware of the contaminants that, um, that just cultivating cannabis can, can bring to those products. So I think that you know, the educational approach is also, um, it's also a you know, shroud in 50 years of reefer madness propaganda. So right now consumers don't have a reliable source um, for can, you know, cannabis safety. So if they hear something from the CDC or from NIDA or FDA, they, you know, they, they go back to this idea of, um, you know, of propaganda and aren't believing it. And it's really dangerous when you think of, you know, drug interactions that happen with cannabis. I mean, cannabis is not for everybody. Um, there are, there, there are people in, um, there are people that should just not use cannabis, right? Because of pre-existing health conditions and then not knowing the potential contaminants uh, puts them at greater risk. Great, thank you for summarizing that stuff. Um, Sasha, would you like to follow with that? Yeah, um, just like Steph, we've also been just educating the consumer and been really concerned with patient safety since the beginning. If you consider our roots, how Realm of Caring started was by getting cannabis as medicine for children, for pediatrics. And so these are parents who are really, everybody's concerned with or should be what they put in their body. But when we're thinking about parents and giving something to their kiddo so that way they can go on to live a quality of life or go on to live a longer life because they've been faced with very debilitating and life-threatening conditions, safety is of the utmost importance. And ensuring that product companies are going to stand by that. If I'm gonna give this to my child, you better believe I'm going to, as a parent, do everything I can to ensure that that's a safe product. But that was 12 years ago. And where we are 12 years now, and which is, I think, is still a big concern, is that when individuals are coming to us, they're using our free hotline to call in just to get information about cannabis. They've tried to have a conversation with their doctor first. And their doctor has said, well, you can try it, but I can't help you. Like, what do you mean? You can't help me with this. So that's that's a big concern because uh, we know that a lot of medical professionals are still not being educated on the importance of the safety. You know, just as Steph said, this is a remedial crop. So we need to take into account all of the things that could arrive in the finished product. Um, and so that's just a big concern for us. And where we're at is empowering the consumer, empowering the patient. So that way they have that knowledge so they can then go back to their doctor and have these open conversations about what they've learned. And that's what we've seen for several years. It's always the parent or the caregiver who's teaching their doctor more than the doctor probably learned in medical school uh, about, about the plant and about the endocannabinoid system. Um, but so that's what where we are right now is just doing the in-person educations and doing the one-on-one -on -one educations. Every single conversation that we have with someone who calls and writes into us is about that product safety and um, going through the with the consumer. How do you how do you vet a product? How do you call the company to um, you know, see if they have a 30-day money back guarantee program or, you know, just something that will help these extra assurances along the way to make the customer feel a little bit more comfortable before purchasing and um, entrusting your product. Awesome. Thank you for that, Sasha. Hey, Morgan, um, please let us know um, what normal's up to around these safety issues. Well, Normal has been advocating on behalf of consumer safety and consumer rights for uh, more than 50 years now. And I think that uh, at this point in time, with uh, you know more than 50 percent of the American population being able to legally access cannabis uh, through adult use programs, uh, it's more important than ever to really focus on consumer rights and consumer advocacy. Um, unfortunately, the problem is that I think a lot of cannabis consumers uh, think that as soon as they don't have to worry about arrest, they don't need any sort of uh, uh, assistance with looking out for their rights and their personal safety. And, uh, you know, the organizations on this call right now are, uh, you know, the proof 
uh, that uh, you absolutely do need uh, people that are looking out for consumers in a post-legalization world. Um, you know, even beside all the criminal justice issues that uh, uh, normally come up, you know, things like housing, education, uh, you know, child custody, et cetera, um, individual personal health right. when it comes to being able to purchase uh, cannabis products that uh, are regulated. I think it's very important and education is the most important facet of that. Uh, you know, this is something that uh, we have to deal with in, uh, you know, legal states and illegal states, knowing exactly what sort of products people are putting in their body are regulated and which are not. And this is something that normal is dedicated to uh, informing consumers about and working with them in order to uh, help use their political power to change the landscape, uh, both regulatorily as well as legally, uh, that in a way that protects consumers. Excellent. So great having all three of these organizations on this call to talk about this topic. Thank you. Um, David, I'm sure you have something to add about this as well. Always, you know, I'll try to keep it brief, uh, you know, echoing what Sasha, Steph and Morgan said, you know, I think a lot about the history of any consumer movement and, you know, think about like Ralph Nader, who really drove consumer safety in the 60s. And we're at a place where, you know, to Morgan's point, hey, it's awesome. We have come to a place where you don't have to worry about being arrested in most jurisdictions across the United States and North America. That's still a far cry from reality globally. Um, but then we get to the second phase of, great, the novelty or the access issue is, sol is solved. And say, maybe novelty has worn off a bit. Now we have to think about the safety of these products. You know, what's going to keep consumers from coming back and buying, especially if you're a patient, is there consistency in these products? What does that look like? You know, I go back to thinking about cars. It was a novelty in the early 1900s to just get in a combustion engine powered vehicle and move across the country. Wow. Then we realize these are death traps and we shouldn't, ex we shouldn't be okay with, you know, the number of deaths happening. We need consumer safety. We need brakes that work and are reliable. We need tires that aren't just going to like explode while you're driving down the highway. We need seat belts, basic, basic concepts that didn't exist. And so that's a great place to be at, but it's also super critical because I think, again, if this is medicine. We should demand, we must demand a level of quality and safety. And that hasn't been a priority until now. Got it. Um, so let's talk about the current regulations in the cannabis and hemp industries evolving to better protect consumers and, and the challenges that remain and, you know, government regulators, operators, consumers, and patients, how can they all work together to ensure that safety and quality standards are consistently upheld? Um, Steph, will you kick us off again, please? Uh, you're on mute, darling. Sorry, I was sneezing earlier. Um, <laughs> Um, I think that the, you know, to start with, consumers and patients need to be invited to the table for these discussions, right? I think that um, uh, in this country, people take it for granted, you know, how uh, food safety happens. And I think when we're looking at this or new, these new businesses that are coming forward to produce products for human consumption, they may not have a background in agriculture, right? Like, you know, farmers in this country take great pride and responsibility of bringing safe products to, um, to, to Americans. And uh, without that background, without that understanding, um, you know, we see people taking shortcuts. I think there's also the reality that, um, you know, as, a, as an organizer, I, I'm always dealing with lots of different stakeholders, right? And I, and I think that the best way to move people is to is to spend some time empathizing um, with with their positions, and I think for um, you know if you look at the cannabis businesses today, they're all struggling. Um, you know, I, I, despite the headlines that say that there's billions of dollars, uh, you know, they're they're really struggling to to make payroll, and I think that um, you know the the sort of false um, premise that the cannabis industry is a huge success means that individuals are, are taking second mortgages out on their house, 
um, taking their kids' education to get to keep a cannabis business operating. And so if you don't have a background in farming, if you don't have a background in um, uh, in consumer goods, right? It, it, it might be really tempting to take a shortcut, right? Um, it might be tempting to just not do that, that next, um, that next step, uh, to make sure that there's no, um, residual solvents in an extract, right? But the reality of what, of the impact of the health of, of consumers is, is frightening. And I think for, um, for many of the the impacts of these contaminants, they're not they're not something that are felt right away, right? Like you know, there may be some vomiting or maybe hives with some of these contaminants, but uh, you know, just talking to a reporter from Miami, um, and I said, you know, you don't turn purple, right? When when there is pesticide in your product, right? You don't. There's not like some visible thing that happens, and you may not know that you've been using contaminated products until you have children. And, you know, this isn't a joke, right? Like the, the, the long-term impacts of, of some of these products is, is severe. And so I think the, the, um, the regulations, you know, that we're seeing at the, at the state level are, are accounting for two things, right? They're definitely accounting for the, the agricultural part and, you know, and the dealing with foodstuffs and those normal parts of regulations that we see. But they also are dealing with the fact that that there are not established safety profiles for many of these products, right? And so these regulators are taking on this sort of huge um, uh, ask. And so when we see um, uh, various businesses come together and attack these regulations, like farmers coming together to remove aspergillus testing, uh, and they're comparing the you know the guidelines of food or the guidelines of you know that are out there for other products it's just it's apples or oranges mm -hmm. so i think that um one regulators cannabis regulators have like the worst job on the planet um i spent a lot of time trying to explain to people the limited power right they're they're given these huge tasks by the legislatures with tiny budgets um and even the revenue that's coming in through those programs they often don't get to reinvest to figure out um, how this tax money that's now going other places um, won't mean poisoning a population. Um, and they're the public face often of, of these programs. So they really, you know, whether it's patients or the businesses, um, they're constantly under, under attack. And I think that what, what that means in reality is that um, we're seeing a lot of reactionary regulations. Um, and so, for instance, instead of integrating cannabis safety into existing protocols in the state, like utilizing, I don't know, ag commissioners that are already paid by the state that could actually just walk on to these cultivation sites and see if there are pesticides. Um, instead, they're they're stuck with these regulations that put such an emphasis on, on testing at the very end. When in fact, if, if you would actually uh, invest in safety product um, protocols throughout the supply chain, then the products that, you know, that have pesticides that have these other contaminants aren't going to even make it to the point to where they would be tested to be sold to consumers. So I think we need to you'll be aware that, that this is a, um, you know, we're making this up as we go, right? There is not a, um, uh, any, any, any point in history that we can look at of taking a prohibited, um, let's say a, a very actively prohibited substance um, at the federal level and figuring out how to get it to consumers. And so um, this idea that, you know, if it's a plant, it's safe um, is dangerous as well. And so, you know, it's gonna take all stakeholders being a part of that process. And so it also means if you get a product that you think is contaminated, you have to tell someone right? You actually have to report it because if you are not, right, if you get hives from a product and you don't tell someone, then all of these other people are going to get hives from that product. And you know what? It may be a person with a severely uh, compromised immune system that the hives that you felt could put them into the hospital. So consumers and patients, the end users play just a, you know, a very important role in, in the system as well. 
And it's, and it's not, it's not, um, we've got to get out of this mindset. Like you're not, um, narking on someone, right. You're not a snitch. If you say like, Hey, there's pesticides in this product, right. This is at this point, you know, if something is being sold, there is a responsibility that someone is taking to put a product into the, into the marketplace. Hope you're on mute. Sorry anyway. about that. I was like, yeah, that, that's a really good point, Steph. I appreciate you talking about that um, and some of the other safety risks, just to back up for a moment, you mentioned aspergillus and there's all the heavy metals, residual solvents. So, but how, how could a consumer know that? And how can we educate them if the regulations aren't in place to protect them from that from the very beginning? Anyway, um, so thank you. I just wanted to add that in. Yeah. yeah and I would just, yeah. If I could respond just to that, that last piece that you said, and I think of, of, of these, you know, products being in there is I think that is that we just have to, you know, be honest with consumers, right? That these things could be in there, but also, um, uh, you know, cannabis, you know, immediate, like your first time using cannabis won't make you vomit violently the first time, right? Like, you know, maybe after lots of use, there's this rare disease, whatever. I don't want to get into that discussion, but like, you know, cannabis won't cause hives. There are things that cannabis will not do, right? It's the actually the presence of these other contaminants, um, heavy metals that are, that are causing that. And so I think just basic, um, you know, like instead of this is your brain on um, on drugs sort of aspect, imagine education. Like you know, this is uh, uh, this is your digestive system on pesticides. Right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Sorry, um, Sasha. No, no, you're good. I know yeah. all great points, and uh, yeah, I just want to make sure you still had the floor if you needed it, but no, no, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. The yeah. aspergillus testing is also just really important because like in Colorado, we had some companies here who were pushing to get that removed, the testing from the finished product. And, you know, for, you know, it can be dangerous for people who are immunocompromised or have upper respiratory issues, but we have to be we have to be cautioned to assume that the everyday consumer knows how to advocate for their health and they know what's right for their health. So even if there's an individual who is immunocompromised or has a respiratory condition and maybe shouldn't be inhaling cannabis anyway, we don't know that they're not going to. And if they do, what are the risks that are involved? Who is going to be the person that tells them that these molds could be present in their product? And so I think another big thing too, just to speak to CHS and the vomiting and um, the Times article that came out a couple of weeks ago that put a lot of the burden back onto the patient and the burden can't stay with the patient to always be the one to have to advocate for their health. And they said they stated in the article that we've done a bad job at educating the public. That's not true. We've done a bad job at translating scientific knowledge into policy. We've done a bad job at educating our medical system. We've done a bad job at making sure that people who are standing behind dispensary counters are equipped with the tools to help people who come to their counter. There's a lot more that we could do. And I love what Steph was saying about just bringing people to the table and being collaborative in this because or just bringing in the 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 um, people who already know that the people who work in agriculture who know how to identify these pesticides. Like there's people in these places who know how to do this work. And so to have everybody work together and just like Steph said, not take these shortcuts just for the profit margin is really important because we're talking about the healthcare of our nation here. It's you know it's 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 serious stuff. So um, not taking those shortcuts is it's going to be of the utmost importance. Mm, excellent. Yes, thank you. Uh, Morgan, what are your thoughts on the regulations and patients working together? <laughs> well, I think that, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, consumers oftentimes do not recognize that they still have a significant amount of power to influence uh, both uh, regulation, legislation, general policy. Um, and they need to be empowered to do so. And I think that that really comes uh, directly from the industry because uh, once you get to a point of legalization or at least non-criminalization, when you have regulated markets, uh, the interaction with cannabis is primarily between licensed distributors and consumers. And so both sides of this equation need the language uh, that is necessary to be able to talk about issues that they might have, 
both on the production and on the consumption side. And uh, if they don't have that, then there's going to be serious problems. Uh, regulators can only do so much. That's true. Um, I appreciate hearing that consumers and patients have that power, and we often forget that, um, that we haven't the ability to influence and to to write to our members of Congress or our state level regulators and communicate with them. So yeah, thank you for. At the end of the day, it's a caveat emptor. And if you are not an informed consumer, you are you know potentially putting yourself in danger, but at the same time on the production and retail side, if you're not listening to your consumers and your patients in particular, uh, you might not be in the best position to be able to deal with some of the uh, the regulatory issues that you're going to be faced with as a business. That's a great point. Excellent. Yes, operators and consumers probably don't get much interaction together except for at the dispensary counter and and really beyond that it's it's difficult to connect that side of the of the cash register to everything else happening in the operation for sure and i think prioritizing that interaction as a means for uh both consumer and patient education for blood tender and distributor education, as well as for uh, political activation is really being underutilized at this point. Absolutely, well said. So I'd like to, we're about at the halfway mark, doing great. So I'd like to turn the conversation into GMPs and ASTM standards and how they play a role into this whole conversation and how they can improve the overall safety and quality of cannabis products. But what challenges do operators have implementing these standards? And as far as these standards that we have so far, how will they play out into the future, especially as our industry expands into the mainstream and the markets become more regulated? Um, Morgan, actually, can you start that one off, please? Well, I, you know, I think that this one is uh, uh, a little bit interesting because it's not only uh, an issue of regulatory compliance, but it's also an issue of uh, consumer demand. Uh, when you have consumers that are demanding uh, specific types of regulatory control or specific types of information, that can help shape uh, the, uh, the regulatory laws that are in place that govern uh, the, uh, uh, the industry operators. At the same time, you know, we've already seen a lot of industry operators taking the steps to better inform consumers so that they can be more active in the, uh, uh, the transaction process and in what they're putting into their own bodies. So I, you know, I think that this is something that is uh, gonna fall on, uh, on all parties involved and uh, anything that we can do to help foster communication between the, uh, the various points of uh, this industry, you know, producers, consumers, retailers, regulators, et cetera. Um, and I believe, Steph, you mentioned earlier, like bringing patients to the table when we're talking about these things is going to be absolutely necessary. Awesome. Thanks, Morgan. Steph, um, what are your thoughts on the GMPs, ASTM standards that are honestly in development currently? <laughs> Uh, behind the scenes at ASTM with the voluntary consensus groups? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, a ATSM is one of many bodies that are that are creating these protocols and that um, that is an ongoing process, right? Like regulations are never done, right? There's never like, you're, like, like these standard setting bodies, um, you know, are like, they're still setting new standards for like aspirin, right? Like it's, it, it never ends. Um, and so I think what is um, is going to be important, I think, for the success of um, cannabis as a commodity, whether that's a commodity in healthcare industries, whether that's a commodity in the intoxicant industries, um, is is maybe shedding this idea that cannabis is a standalone industry, right? And what I mean by that is, like, of course there are standards for agriculture, right? Of course there are standards for um, for um, how to test a product, right? Like these things are not new. They're just new to people that have been selling cannabis illegally, right? And so um, under the framework of prohibition, 
uh, maybe cannabis is an industry, right? Because it's responsible for every part of the supply chain. But as cannabis moves into mainstream, then it's a it's a agricultural commodity that is going to be used in lots of different ways. And so I think that um, you know. Uh, you know, we have a program at Americans for Safe Access called the Patient Focused Certification. That you know, part of um, the the importance of that project was really adhering to three major pillars of product safety. And for us, that is, you know, making sure that the people that are involved, you know, that are going to be regulated, are a part of that process. So there aren't, you know, just some people making regulations and telling people what to do, but actually, you know, that they have a say and are a part of what that would look like. The second is that it's transparent, right? That that actually, you know, those those standards are available to people to implement, whether they, you know, they don't have to necessarily pay for them um, to see them. Um, and lastly, that that we invest in education so that everyone can follow them, right? And so, if you think about like the food service industry, um, everybody that works in a kitchen has to go through a food handler's get a food handler's permit, right? It's just basic knowledge. Anyone who um, sells alcohol, any bar to any has to, you know, take courses on identifying intoxication or, right. And so these are not new concepts. They're just new for cannabis. And I think what we have seen in this sort of rush to create a cannabis industry, um, is that people are looking for and identifying, um, uh, these ancillary businesses, right, that like non plant touching <laughs> businesses, where they can get investments and fill in the gaps. Um, but the reality is, these are, it's like, you know, these are not, it's not rocket science to have product safety protocols for a commodity. Um, it's just new to cannabis. So mm -hmm. again, I think that, um, you know, uh, for, for the, the legacy um, cultivators for, you know, those amazing um, people that have been creating edibles in their kitchen um, and bringing them to cancer patients, you know, um, you know, if they want to bring that to a larger commercial setting, I think it's important that we invest in education to help them get there, right? And I think that um, consultants and attorneys all play a big role in this, right? Like if you're if you're helping someone get a a dispensary permit or a manufacturing permit. Um, at some point that facility is going to need to be GMP, right? Like, like that's what's happening. Right. And so don't, don't advise them to get a cheap warehouse, you know, somewhere in town that, that they're going to have to in two years spend a million dollars to put a new flooring in. Right. And so I, I think as, as these sort of, you know, people that are coming into the cannabis space because they truly want to be a part of bringing this plant to patients or to consumers, like, there's a responsibility to have them understand that, you know, we're, um, you know, we're still making this up as we go, right? And so if you if you heavily invest in the regulations of today, um, you might not be able to make it when the next level of regulations come in. And so again, like GMP standards are not rocket science, right? Like that is where cannabis is going. And what may seem like a competitive disadvantage today is going to mean survival tomorrow. Yeah, that's a really great point, Steph. I think um, we were seeing that the writing is on the wall as with, what, what is it, David? Maybe at least 12 states are already requiring or recommending GMPs for uh, for operators. So yeah. uh, it's definitely heading in that direction. Um, Sasha, would you like to add on to this, please? Yeah, I didn't know if Morgan, if before you lost your thought, if you wanted to, to say something else. If you had your oh, hand I, up. I just wanted to uh, really uh, back up what uh, Steph just said, that uh, as a cannabis consumer, as a cannabis producer, as a cannabis retailer, as a cannabis regulator, uh, you absolutely have to be involved in the political process because that is what is going to determine the future of this industry and the future of cannabis consumption. And so if uh, you are interested in getting involved in this space in any way, shape or form, or you already are, uh, you absolutely need to be involved in the political process because that is going to be what is involved in setting those standards, in setting the rules. 
And, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, everybody on this call understands that, uh, you know, sometimes that can be incredibly difficult, but it's a necessity. You can't just run a business in this space. You have to be an advocate. That's yeah, and I think, Morgan, that's really important. And that's kind of what I was going to say is just making sure that the knowledge gets transferred outside of the bubble, because, you know, I know that GMP and ASTM, they go far beyond cannabis. But what we're talking about in the cannabis space, there's so many acronyms that get gets floated around. Mm -hmm. And when we're think, thinking about policy and we're thinking about politicians and how little that they know about any of this. So making sure that that knowledge is really transferred and shared. So that way, when they are, you know, standing up on the Senate floor and they're advocating for a bill that is ensuring that these standards and these practices are implemented in their state or their wherever they're living, that they can really advocate it by detailing exactly what this means. What do these standards mean for the general public? And then that is able to trickle down to our general public because I, you know, how long did it take for USDA organic to kind of explode and people to actually want to go for organic products and understand what that means and understand if it actually meant anything at all, or if they're just slapping a label on it. So I think um, just making sure that information comes out of the cannabis industry, gets into our policies, and then trickles down to the everyday consumer who can, so everyone then is cyclically advocating for their health in all these just different areas. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's jump in there if I can. So, you know, I think that's such important points that have been mentioned. And when I think about ASTM standards, uh, you know, as the vice chair, I look at what ASTM has done for 125 years now is provide that forum that has protected consumers through over 90 industries, right? Things that we take for granted everywhere. If you get on the street and even look at a stop sign behind a stop sign, you'll see ASTM written behind it. That's there's standards for the colors and the reflectivity of those stop signs that ensure consumer safety. Think of a stop sign from 60 years ago versus newer ones now. Look at your Sharpies and your highlighters. They all conform to ASTM standards. And, you know, kudos to like Steph and Asa. It was groups like them. Asa was at the table. If another reason why Committee D37 exists, a major reason is because of Asa being there at the table, being the voice of consumers, working with APA. I created the first industry standards and saying, here, now we need to go through the consensus process where we get anybody, any consumer can be a member. If you're not a member in your business, you're missing out. You don't have a seat at the table. You don't have a voice to vote on this consensus process with regulators, right? With academic experts. So we think about this. We need to give the consumers a voice. There's a table for that. We need to bring everybody together so that we can translate and transfer that knowledge between the PhDs that understand the toxicologists that understand the really nuanced considerations of pesticides, heavy metals, mycotoxins, you name it, and what a consumer needs and how to translate that to a simple label, right? On a package, this shouldn't be that hard. I, I like Steph's point of, hey, maybe we don't have all the data yet. And if we're putting products out there that may cause a consumer or patient reaction, especially if you're an immunocompromised, put a damn label on there and say, caution, right? That's the bare minimum. Is that really that hard to do? And, you know, I think about these standards, they're the minimums, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> like this is not hard. So the bare minimum, the bar is so low. And right now I, it keeps me up at night so often because we don't have a minimum bar and that's a race to the bottom. And that's really a bottomless pit. And who's impacted negatively? Consumers. What does that do? It erodes trust in the industry. And that's something that we can't afford. We've come so far in, what, 50 plus years, thanks normal, since the CSA uh, was put in place to you know overcome uh, so many issues around integrity and fear mongering. We can't stop now. These New York Times articles can't come out. Um, and whether they have a shed of truth or not, that impacts the perceptions and we can't afford that as an industry. We have to come together and work smarter. On that note, how can we do that? What are the best practices for protecting these consumers and patients? And, you know, what can the cannabis and hemp operators adopt to ensure product safety and efficacy? And are, if any examples come to mind, um, of best practices that have already been implemented to protect consumers and patients. Uh, let's talk about those too. Uh, I'm going to throw this back to Steph. Yeah, I think um, 
you know, there, there has to be consumer demand um, in order for, for businesses to, to, to meet these standards. Right. And this is true anywhere, right. You either, you have governments that are going to, that are going to set a floor and it's consumers, right. That make um, businesses strive for the ceiling. And so I think that, um, as we move forward, you know, we need to be mindful of how regulations are used in a capitalist society, one, right? Like part of why we went to APA um, to work with them to create the cannabis standards was that they let everyone come to the table, right? There are lots of industries where um, regulations are used to weed out smaller players, um, right? Like, so if you look at like the waste industry, for instance, this whole idea of putting a lining under uh, landfill. It's total BS. Um, and it was really expensive. And so the only people that could afford to do it were the three major um, uh, trash companies, right? And so they bought up landfills, penny of, pennies on the dollars from, from counties. So that, so that like in our society, that is one way that regulations are used, which is why it's so important that everyone is at the table, right? And so as we if you look at sort of how we created regulations around cannabis outside of um, product safety, uh, we basically created regulations that are like are are more strict than plutonium handling, right? And it was because you know law enforcement played an outsized role in creating those programs at the state level. Um, we had like the whole point of them was to have as few people as possible participate in the medical cannabis program. And so, you know, it's not just looking at, you know, um, you know, adding product safety standards, but really relooking at the whole framework and see like, you know, um, how can we do this better so that people can have money to invest in product safety, right? What are, what are some of the, the regulations that are ridiculous and what is the responsibility of um, the states that are taking money for applications and for licenses to make sure that they're not um, granting too many licenses, right? That there's actually going to be enough consumers to buy their products so they can stay open and make sure that they're not cutting corners. So I, it's, I think it's as, we, as we're moving forward and, and bringing cannabis into a, a legal framework, we need to get rid of some of the old frameworks, right? And so I think when you see things like the New York Times article, that's been mentioned a couple of times here, um, I actually was not offended by that article. I felt like if you if you look at all the other reporting that's been done about cannabis, um, it was trying to like counteract the fact that nobody's been talking about that at all, right? It's just been you know um, story after story of how big the cannabis industry is. Um, without talking about any of these other components. So I think that that story and that much um, space that they gave to it was really sort of counteracting the fact that nobody had been reporting about it, right? And so I think that if we if we don't rid ourselves of a prohibition frame as we approach cannabis, as we move forward, we're going to end up exactly back at the same point, right? And, and that would look something like, one... The, the entire framework of selling cannabis to people has happened under medical cannabis, right? That was That's how we got here, whether people want to remember it or not. And that framework was actually compassionate use, which actually means literally better than nothing, right? So there weren't a lot of regulations. There wasn't a lot of like proof that this is actually efficacious or that it's safe, right? Compassionate use literally means if you're going to die, smoke cannabis before you die, right? Like it's not like that was like the the extent of those regulations. So, um, you know, as we're moving into a regulated space, if we're not careful, if we, you know, a lot of the adult use legislation that's being um, recommended in DC, as well as the hemp regulations is calling to put cannabis in the FDA. Um, and the FDA has already said that they want cannabis to go through a drug approval process, which Again, that's why we went to the states in the first place, that that doesn't work. Um, I'm not excited about going back to the beginning. I don't know about you guys. And secondly, you know, it, um, those, those regulations look like tobacco regulations of the Tobacco Control Act. And while that was a positive, I mean, look at, at the tobacco industry now, right? Like what products that are currently being sold in the hemp space or the um, cannabis space would meet that... Um, that level of 
um, a, a rigorous proof, right? Like, like how many, you know, where is the product safety profile for 99% THC consumption every day? So like, these are some of the things that are gonna be coming at us. And I think you have to pay attention to the entire component. And then lastly, I'll just say the prohibition mindset um, you know, goes, goes back into like where we've invested in research. So NIDA over the last um, 50 years has put billions of dollars in proving the harm of cannabis, right? And in 2017, this amazing report came out of the National Academies that actually highlighted the benefits of cannabis and actually put forward research protocols that, that you know, recommendations to the, the United States to follow. Those were ignored, right? And here we have moved forward with, um, with hemp and uh, cannabis coming across the country. And then we have a new National Academies report that is talking about the public health components that are real, those are, those are real. But we, I think that we, there's a real risk right now of skipping the medical benefits part again, and the same players, NIDA, the drug abuse community, the treatment community, which is also an industry, by the way, um, and the same researchers that were proving the harms of cannabis under a prohibition model, right, are going to get the same dollars to keep proving the harms of cannabis under a public health model without mm -hmm. studying the benefits. And the risk of doing that is that when you, when you look at <laughs> conditions like I don't mean to laugh, um, but the cannabis use disorder, right? A disorder that, that you qualify that you have if you meet two of 11 criteria. And mm. those, again, like there are people who are suffering from, I don't want to like diminish the people that are having problems with cannabis use, but to say that you have cannabis use disorder, if you use cannabis every day and, and it's hard for you to stop using it, I think you could say that of Tylenol, Advil, any place, right, where, where a patient is treating an imbalance in their endocannabinoid system, right, is, is now being, they're being told that they have a problem. And the problem is that we have very unhealthy endocannabinoid systems, right? Like we don't have good food. We don't sleep. We have, a, like, we have all these horrible things that have really caused us to be an unhealthy society. And so when consumers have access to something that's trying to balance that out, granted, without them exercising or eating good food. Um, yes, they're going to use it every day, right? And it may not be the best treatment or the best thing that they should be doing. But if we approach cannabis use from a prohibition and addiction framework, we're going to miss this opportunity um, to see what products like cannabis can do and contribute to a healthier society. Mm, it's so very well said stuff. Yeah, a few things you said. Uh, I must have gotten that um, regulated heavier than plutonium line from you because I've definitely <laughs> said it probably a hundred times yeah, yeah. over the last decade. So, for about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, we, but we need the right amount of regulations and, and we, we, we do need to give credit to the plant for the medical benefits that the science community is finally catching up and being able to prove. Um, yes. Uh, so, all right, we have just a couple minutes left here. Um, Sasha, what would you like to add? Um, I just wanted to uh, hone in on something that Morgan said earlier, which was tapping into the consumer, which I think is a, a good best practice for protecting our consumers and our patients. Because if we're, if, and if we're talking about tapping in, into our consumers, if I can be so bold to say, you know, as a company, connect with normal, connect with ASA, connect with realm of caring, because that's what we're doing every day is we're talking to these consumers and we're advocating for their health. And so that's a great place to start. And then we're seeing on the other side, this outcome where um, people are paying attention to things like observational research. They want to understand the user experience, which is why NIDA have, has this largely fund funded grant going to Hopkins to run this national observational research registry to enroll 10,000 people over the next five years to understand the health outcomes from cannabis use. And so we're seeing there is this shift is taking place. Notice is 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 happening. But my first thought is those companies who are doing it right, who have limited recalls, who are successful, have successful models, are those that are taking the feedback and they're aligning with organizations like ours and they are listening to their consumers and their concerns and their needs. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you for what you do, Sasha. <laughs> uh, David, I know you wanted to say something yeah. here. 
Yeah, you know, when I think about like what can folks that are listening do, right? I mean, uh, Sasha, you said it well, like go support these organizations, right? If you care at all about medical cannabis and its viability in the marketplace, give Steph a call, click the donate button on their website. It's really simple. Like that goes a long freaking way. If you're an operator and you're not in a state regulated marketplace and you sell anything that potentially has intoxicating effects, intoxicating cannabinoid, use the universal symbol that's adopted in five states now and being adopted in several others. It's really easy. It's it's a consensus. I could go on. We've had a whole episode about the consensus uh, process and the universal symbol. Use it. If you're a dispensary, Promote products that are meeting these best practices. Ask, has it been GMP certified? And not, hey, I'm the operator and I said that, you know, I, I claim that I'm meeting GMPs. No, no, no. There's an independent process for that. That's how the world works, whether it's the patient focused certification program or another third party. Promote those products and help educate your consumers. Throw a little QR code up for this for a survey. Create these surveys and collect this information. And the last thing I'll say to tie back to one of the questions is who's who's co conducting this research, right? We still have the gaps. And so we have to address those. And so the S3 Collective, my nonprofit that we stood up a year ago is bridging that gap. We're developing relationships and so proud to be able to have ASA as friends of ours and normal and get to know Realm of Caring because you guys are doing the research over at Realm of Caring and Johns Hopkins. We need to amplify that. We need more scientific experts. So we're connecting universities. Steph and I were both at um, the Maryland's Cannabis Science and Therapeutics Program speaking a few weeks ago. They gave us over 50 volunteers, and these are master's students in cannabis. And these are folks that are dispensary operators, they're legacy growers, they're, some of them are now regulators. These aren't just academic uh, you know, philosophers. These are real boots on the ground experts that are now getting master's degrees and able to power the industry forward. So we're mobilizing those types of individuals to accelerate the development of these standards. Come work with us. This is the future. We're creating it. Thanks awesome. for going to my TED Talk. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, I wanted to let Morgan give final thoughts. And uh, before I do that, Steph had shared a resource that I'll include in the follow-up email to everyone that registered next week. It's um, Navigating Cannabis Safety. So you can find it at safeaccessnow.org slash navigating underscore cannabis underscore safety. And again, I will link that in the follow-up email to everyone. Um, Morgan, final thoughts today. Well, I think everybody else pretty much covered it, but uh, I mean, really at the end of the day, if you want to have a successful business in this space, and if you want to move cannabis policy forward, you have to consider consumers. But at the same time, you also have to work with people that are doing likewise and that are developing the standards by which consumers are going to be affected. So I highly recommend everybody out there that is involved in this space to uh, get involved in ASTM to talk to S3, to uh, you know, really get involved in this process, but not only that, but to talk to your customers, see what their concerns are, see what their, their issues and pain points are. Um, obviously cost is gonna be the big one for now, but uh, I think that uh, you know, unless we incorporate all aspects of, uh, uh, of this ecosystem, and uh, with a real focus on the end line of it, like the people that are actually consuming these products, we're not going to be able to get to a reasonable space when it comes to regulatory control at either the state or the federal level. So we need everybody to be involved in this process. This is a collaborative issue. Thank you very much, Morgan. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for being on this webinar. This was great, um, really great conversations. Appreciate everyone who attended live as well. As a reminder, all the past episodes can be found on the GMP Collective's website and YouTube channel in case you missed one. And please hit that subscribe button on YouTube as well. Please reach out to gmpcollective.com if you'd like to learn more. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next month. We'll also address some of those Q&A questions we didn't get to in a follow-up message as well. Thanks, everybody, so much. Thank you all. Good to see you all. Thank you.